We're going to be looking this morning at Acts chapter 2 and continuing uh, to work our way through the book of Acts over the next few months. And so I encourage you, if you haven't already, uh, to spend some time reading through there. There's no way that we're going to be able to hit even every major event that happens in the book of Acts. And so um, in order to stay in context, it will really help you if you read along. Um, now, you can find today's notes in the Bible app under the events section. And at the end of that, in case I forget to remind you at the end of our time together today, there's actually a 28-day reading plan that will take you through the book of Acts. Uh, there's also a reading plan in there that will take you through, I think it's a five-day reading plan, looking at unity, which actually falls into what we're looking at this morning. Although there are a lot of things that go on in Acts chapter 2, what we're going to focus on with our time together today is those last few verses as Luke gives us a snapshot of the early church. He's going to do this a few times through the book of Acts. He kind of pulls the camera back for a minute uh, away from focusing on individual people and individual events and kind of gives us a broad idea of what the church looked like at that point in time. And what we're going to see this morning is that they spent a whole lot of time together. In a lot of ways, I really feel like that if they were able to see what modern church looked like, they would be very surprised. And not for the reasons that many of us think. We think they would be surprised by the music. Probably not, because they had music then that was contemporary to their time. That probably would not have been a shocker for them. They probably would not have been shocked at the way we dressed because they dressed normally the way they would have the rest of their lives. That wouldn't have been a big deal to them. I think they would be very surprised at how much we obsess over facilities because they had none. They met in homes. They met in the temple. They met wherever they could. And I also think they would be very surprised at us not seeing the value of spending time together. As we look at these last few verses of Acts chapter 2, what we're going to see is that they spent a lot of time together. They spent time together in the temple. They spent time together in prayer. They spent time together reading God's word. They spent time together eating and fellowshipping and just enjoying each other's company and building relationships. And I think not only does that set us apart from the way that they did church now versus the, or then versus the way we do church now, but I think also there are some things that we do as a part of normal Christianity today that actually hinder our witness and our our walk with Christ. For example, dropping out of church. Now, you're here today, so obviously that's not you, but it is not uncommon in our culture today for someone to get hurt or to just let life happen and draw them away from the church entirely. There are 8,000 people within a mile of this church. There are somewhere around 20 or so percent of them 20 to 30 percent maybe that, that claim the same kind of faith system that we have, which would be a whole lot of people. But our churches are not full. A whole lot of people have dropped out. Also, though, I think they would be very surprised at us only associating with each other within the walls of this church. Very few of us intentionally outside of family spend time with each other between Sundays. There are not nearly enough of us, and I'm not talking about Wednesday night service and Sunday night service and all of those kinds of things. I'm talking about intentionally taking someone out for coffee, intentionally sharing a meal with someone, intentionally building a relationship with someone. I think they would also be very surprised at how sporadically many of us show up. We've had this conversation before years ago when I was a teenager. Active members within a church, when you talk about active members, you talked about how many times they showed up in a week. Now we have backed that up. We talk about active members in, in, in relationship to how often they show up in a month. And another thing I think that would surprise them is... Those of us that come regularly, we show up week in and week out, yet we are still isolated from one another. Because our lives are so hectic, we want to boil church down to the, 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 the lowest minimum amount of time that I've got to be within the doors of that building. So I come in, I was going to say right before the church service starts, but for those of you that are on the stage, what you notice is a good percentage of this congregation comes in after the service starts. After Greg's done with announcements, I don't know if Greg scares you guys or what it is, 
But after he finishes his announcements and sits down and we start the first song, about 50% of our congregation comes in the building. I don't know if you guys wait outside the door or one of these days I'm going to have someone else be up here. So like, Kyle, you should check that out for me. I want you to do some research. I want you to hang out out there and let me know what they're doing. Because I think they're up to something. Do you really want to know? Maybe. I'm going to leave that up to you. <laughs> you figure it out and then you decide whether or not you want to hurt my feelings. Um, but, but a lot of us, we, we rush in at the last minute. We rush out as soon as we can afterwards. Sometimes people come in and they sit because they want to make sure that they get their seat. And so there's not communication going on. There's not bonding going on. In other words, we're not being the church. Because a part of the underlying issue is that we think of church now in, in, in terms of a place that we go. Or something that we do versus who we are. And so although as we kind of go through th some things today, I'm going to talk about church attendance. I want you to understand from the outside, the outset that that's not the only thing that I'm talking about. Really, when you bring it down, the title says it this morning. I want us to understand that we are in this together. I want us to understand that we are the body of Christ. I want us to understand that in order for us to experience everything that God has called us to experience, in order for us to do everything that God has called us to do, we have got to develop deep and meaningful relationships with each other. We should not look around the room in a church our size and see faces of people that we don't know their names. We shouldn't be able to look around a room in a church our size. Of course, if we have guests, that's different. But because I know somebody's going to bring that up later. We shouldn't really even look around a room in a church this size and not know the lives of the people who are here. Their occupations, their kids. We should, we should know Harvey and Tammy well enough to know that that cute little sound you heard a couple minutes ago was not Harvey. That was their granddaughter <laughs> that is back there with them. We should know these things about the lives with, uh, of the people that we get to share this life with and that we get to worship alongside of and that we get to do what God's called us to do in this community with. And so the charge this morning is, is partially about showing up here, but it's more about being invested in each other's lives. I'm going to read with you the book of Acts, beginning chapter 2, verse 42. And I'm not, going to, I'm not going to point these out for you as we go through, but I want you to just listen for all the descriptive words about how together and united and of one mind and in the same place at the same time that the original church was. Verse 42, it says, They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship to the breaking of bread and to prayer, everyone was filled with awe, and many wonders and miraculous signs were done by the apostles. All the believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes, and they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this moment in time. And I reflect back, Father, over the 8 o'clock service when I prayed about um, our opportunity to worship in safety. But we really are beginning to understand that that's not entirely true even within this nation. And so, Father, I pray that... That in spite of the uneasiness that we may sometimes feel or the concern that we may have about the shootings that are taking place and the other things that are happening, not only in schools but in churches around the world, Father, I pray that our peace and our hope would, would lie in you. And that no matter the circumstances on the outside, that we would, as the first Christians did, cling to one another, to build relationships with one another so that we can support each other and lift one another up so that we can honor you through those relationships and so that we can reflect your light and your love to this world. Because when the outside looks at us, Father, it is a shame that they see disunity and division and all of those things rather than unity and love and sacrifice and family. I pray, Father, that this morning as we are confronted by your word, that we would come to a place that we would be willing to change. Every one of us. Because we need to. We need to do church differently in order to honor you, in order to reach this community. Give us the courage to do that, Father. In your son's name we pray.
So there's actually a lot that takes place in Acts chapter 2 leading up to this. So before we dive back into the text that I just read to you, I want to take a little bit of time to look at what has gone on. And one thing that has gone on is that my remote's not working. Yeah, it's not. Am I plugged in? Do me a favor. Advance to the next slide. Um, see if maybe I need some batteries, please. There we go. All right, they fixed it. Thank you. It's great having a good tech team. And, and oh, all right, they're going to hate me for this, but I want you guys to turn your eyes back that way for a second. And I want you to notice how many teenagers are up there. Isn't that awesome? I mean, that is great. That is what the body of Christ should look like. It used to, it used to honestly, even when I was a teenager, it used to frustrate me when people would talk about us as the future church. You will not find that in the Bible. They are the church now. We just need to treat them like they're the church now. And then one day when we do fade out of the way and they take over, maybe they'll get some things right that we have gotten wrong. Let's engage them and let them be a part of stuff. They're doing some amazing things back there that when it runs right, we don't notice. When things go wrong, of course, we all, what are they doing back there? So, now, I don't know what that was, but that was not them. But I, I, wanted you, I wanted you to get a view of what they did. I want you guys to know that we appreciate you and what you're doing. So that being said, a lot has happened since we left um, off in Acts chapter 1, verse 8. So if you remember what we talked about last week, they were with Jesus, and this was right before they literally watched him ascend into heaven. Uh, he had been crucified. He had been buried. He had been resurrected. He had spent 40 days with them, teaching them and pouring into them, eating with them, fellowshipping with them, building them up and preparing for this next step when he was physically going to be gone. But if you remember from John chapter 14 through 16, he had already made them some promises. And one of the big ones was that when he physically left this world, that the Holy Spirit would come. And he repeats that promise in Acts 1.8. So when we talked about that last week, he said, you'll receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you. He had told them, go back to Jerusalem and wait. When the Holy Spirit comes, you will receive power and you will be my witnesses. And that's what we looked at last week was our call, our mission, our life being about being a witness for Jesus Christ. After that, they went back to Jerusalem and did what he said. And then Peter stood up within the group and said, you know what? We were deserted and betrayed by Judas. We should find someone, according to the scripture, who will take his place. And Matthias was set apart to do that. After that, Jesus' promise was fulfilled. The Holy Spirit came, and the Holy Spirit came in a miraculous way. They heard sounds. They saw tongues that looked like they were on fire, and they separated, and they came down on everyone. We're told 120 of them gathering in that upper room, praying and waiting for this moment. It was such a climactic and intense time that they, didn't, they couldn't just stay within the worship service. They actually spilled out onto the streets. And went down and immediately started proclaiming the word of God. How awesome would it be if you guys got so fired up after worship that I come up to preach and you guys are like, nope, we're going to go talk to somebody about Jesus. I would be okay with that. Now, that doesn't mean you can stage a coup next week just so you can get to lunch early. If you get up and leave the worship service, I am expecting to hear a report of how you ministered while you were gone. <laughs> that doesn't count. Nice try, though. And the miracle continued in what happened next because they didn't just go downstairs and proclaim the word of God. But what we're told as the Holy Spirit worked through Luke to give us this account is that they proclaimed the works and the glory of God in languages that they themselves did not know. And not just any language, not just an angelic language that other people couldn't understand. But, but what's going on in the context is that there is an influx of people that have come to Jerusalem for a celebration. And they're all Jews that have come from other lands, places where they've grown up outside of Israel. And so what they hear taking place is that these 120 people that have spilled down from the upper room are now proclaiming the word of God in the native languages of all of those people who have gathered. And of course, this, is, this amazing move of God and miracle is misunderstood. People think they're crazy. Someone said they must be drunk. I don't know about you. I've been around drunk people. They have never done this. I've never once seen someone who was intoxicated that talked to me about Jesus coherently, let alone in another language. But 
they did. If you remember from last week, we talked about Peter as an example of how God transforms lives. And we talked about how Peter went from this fisherman who was just known for putting his foot in his mouth to now being the one who stands up and says, the scripture says we should replace Judas with someone else. He also stands up in this moment and says, the scripture said that all of these things that are going on would happen. That the day would come when God would speak in this way. And the people heard. And in one day, one response to one sermon, one response to the move of God, 3,000 people come to know Christ. And that moment is where Luke backs the camera up for a minute and says, this is what the scene looks like. Now that God has done these things and, and the word of Jesus has been fulfilled and the Holy Spirit has come and the church is birthed in a big way, exploding in one day from 120 to around 3,000. This is what the church looked like. And I firmly believe that if we look honestly at what the first church looked like, then we see what God intended for the church to look like. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. And everyone was filled with awe and had many wonders and miraculous signs that were done by the apostles. All believers were together and had everything in common. Selling their possessions and goods, they gave to anyone as he had need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts and they broke bread in their homes. And they ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favor of all the people. And the Lord added their number daily those who were being saved first thing that we see in this snapshot is that they shared their life together it was not about how short of a time can I spend at the church today How close to the start of the service can I roll into the parking lot? How quickly after it's over can I roll out? Because they saw the value in spending time together. See, the thing is, when you go all the way back to the beginning, God makes it clear that he created us to live within community. Think of that scene in, in Genesis, right? You, you have this picture of where God has bent down. And the Bible says that he literally formed Adam out of the dust of the ground. And then he breathed life into him. How intimate is that? We I mean, think about the contrast. He spoke and there was life. He spoke and there was a world. He spoke and there were trees and plants. He spoke and there was water. He spoke and there were animals. And he bent down. And he formed us with his hand. And then he gave Adam something to do. He gave him the care of that garden. He gave him the job of naming the animals. And then God said, it's not good for a man to be alone. Now, some of you wives go, amen. Have you seen my husband when he's alone? <laughs> That's not really the idea. <clears throat> God gave Adam the time he needed. And the job he needed to see that he needed companionship in his life. Every animal had a mate. And Adam didn't have anybody else like him. Think about this for a minute. Adam had God. But we, even in, in Adam's perfect mind at that time and place, Adam couldn't have understood all that God is. And so God very intentionally from the beginning gave us a relationship with him, a relationship that is definitely supposed to overshadow everyone, but a relationship that also is understood in the, relation, in the context of relationships with other people. Remember, it was Jesus that said, I'll tell you what the greatest commandment is. The greatest commandment is to love God, period. And the second commandment's like it. Love your neighbor like yourself. To me, there doesn't seem to be this huge differentiation between our relationship with God and our relationship with others. They are meant to go together. We were built to live in community. 
And in that community, we draw closer to God. And as we draw closer to God, our capacity to love others grows. 1 John 4.11, John writes this, Dear friends, since God loved us, we ought to also love one another. Remember Jesus in that same scene in John, as they're done in the upper room, and he talks to them about what leadership looks like and what it means to submit yourself to others in order to serve them. He then turns and says, and I also give you another command. And what was it? You know, love each other. Because by your love for each other, this world will know that you love God. It's all interconnected. What's the point? These first Christians got that to a deeper extent than we do. And so they understood that, that Lone Ranger Christianity does not exist. That my relationship with God was meant to be lived out amongst other people. Because you can sharpen me and I can sharpen you. You can encourage me and I can encourage you. And all of us together can strive to honor God the best that we can and to draw closer to him. And as we draw closer to him, then our capacity to love one another grows. And that is the context in which Jesus says, greater love has no one than this than to love or lay down his life for his friends. He, of course, was speaking of himself. And the sacrifice that he was about to make. But he also set an example for <coughs> us. That we are to love that way. I came across a story this last week. That uh, Charles Swindoll tells. And it didn't give a lot of detail. So I'm not sure if this was just meant to be an illustration. Or if it really happened. But it, I think it, it, it paints this picture. First let me back up and say that. That as I work with. Veterans, military veterans, one of the things that I hear from them over and over again is that war was horrible. But I miss the camaraderie of being with the guys. I have been forever shaken by and changed by the horrible things that I saw people do to each other. But I miss being able to get together with the guys. I miss having that common purpose in my life. I miss the way that we shared our lives together. It's into that kind of context that Charles Swindoll tells the story of two guys that were in World War I. They grew up together, they enlisted together, and they served overseas together. And one day on the battlefield in a horrible fight, they got separated from each other. And as the one dove into uh, the trenches, he, he turned to see that his buddy was left up on the battlefield wounded. And just as he began to breach the trench to go after his friend, the sergeant grabbed him and pulled him back down and said, Don't you go out there. You will get killed, and your friend is already dead. So just leave him there because there's no point. At some point as the battle raged on, the sergeant got distracted, and the guy went back over anyway. He crawled out to his friend, and he was able to get to him and grab him, and he brought him back. But as he and his friend tumbled back into the trench, the sergeant turned and saw that now they're both wounded. The first one who had been left up is gone. And the buddy that went to get him is almost gone. And the sergeant, half angered and half moved by the scene, looks at him and said, I told you it would be a waste. Your friend's dead, like I said, and soon you will be also. And it's at that point that the other soldier gasped and said, it wasn't a waste because when I got to him, he was still alive. And his very last words were, I knew you would come. Why is it, friends, that some of the harshest and some of the toughest people on the planet who go by the name Soldier can love that way? Yet those of us who have had our lives transformed by God are, are not only not willing to die for one another, we're not willing to live for one another. What we see in these first century Christians is that they, they were so bound by their love for each other and for God that they shared their lives. They made time for each other to invest in each other. And out of that, then they shared each other's burdens. If you go back to verse 44, it says all the believers were together and they had everything in common and selling their possessions and goods they gave to anyone as they had need. 
These people were so willing because of their love for each other, to care for each other, that they were literally willing to part with things that either they didn't see a necessity for in their life, or maybe they did actually need them. But, but the person who had the need was more important than the stuff that they held on to. How many of us have stuff in our attics, in our garages, in storage facilities that we rent that can be used to meet the needs of others? It's a sad commentary on who we are as people. And I have been wrestling with this more and more. For some reason, it just seems like, and, and the, the, the struggle for me is I don't know how many of these are legitimate and how many are not. But I'm getting these, these leaders from orphanages all over the world now on a regular basis that are reaching out to me and that are saying, can you help me? Because I don't have food for 60 kids tomorrow. And it, it, it's tough for us because we don't know who is really needing help feeding kids and who is just wanting to line their pockets. But what I do know in that situation is that we as Americans are blessed with far more than we need. And we just continue to accumulate more stuff. We, we accumulate more clothes and we accumulate more cars and more big screen TVs. And we have houses that are huge and we pay a lot of money to pump electricity and so we can have lights and so that we can have air conditioning. And all of these things that we do for our own comfort. And then when the people of the world reach out to us with legitimate needs, we either don't want to help them because we don't want to deny ourselves or we're so deep in debt that we can't. You see, the progression is that step one is that we've got to allow God to transform our hearts. Anything else, just rushing it ahead and helping orphans because it's the right thing to do, trying to feed the homeless, trying to help out a friend, you know, whatever. If we're just doing that for the sake of doing it, all it is is changing in behavior. All it is is behavior modification. And at the end of the day, there's not real eternal value in that. But when we begin by allowing God to transform our hearts so that now we are meeting needs out of love, that means something. If you think just for a minute about the people in this room, if we built true, deep, meaningful relationships with each other, there would be no guilt, there would be no twisting of arms, there would be no begging to pull resources to meet a need. And I can tell you from, from the perspective of being pastor now for a while and working with our deacons and trying to meet benevolence needs, trying to get hospital visits done, I have seen this play out over and over again, that the people in this church who are well-known, dearly loved, I have no problem whatsoever getting any need they have met, any, any, any hospital visit they need done. Sometimes I have to actually say, stop going and visiting that person so they can get some rest. But the other side of that is that when we have someone new come or when we have someone that for whatever is a little bit more withdrawn and a little bit more isolated from the rest of the pack, when that person has a need, I can ask and ask and ask for someone to go visit them and no one will go. I can ask for us to pull some money together to meet a financial need or a physical need of some sort. And people start asking questions of why. Well, how did they get themselves into that position? And are we really the ones that need to help? That's not what our faith is supposed to look like. People should be able to see in you and in me lives that are so radically changed by our experience with Christ that when they look at us, they see that's what the love of God looks like. That's what the love of Jesus Christ looks like. That's what it means to be a Christ follower. Later on, we're going to see that in just a couple of chapters as John and Peter stand before the same people who sentenced Jesus to death and ask to give an explanation for why they did something as crazy as heal somebody. We're going to see those men say they're not educated. We know that, that they've been with Jesus. 
That's the reputation that we want to have. Paul wrote in Galatians 6, 2, that we are to carry one another's burdens so that in this way we can fulfill the law of Christ. Proverbs 17, 17 said, a friend loves at all times and a brother is born for times of adversity. We are commanded, we are charged to meet each other's needs, to stand with each other in hard times, to weep with those who are weeping without feeling the necessity of speaking to them to make them be quiet so we feel better. We're called to do difficult things for each other as an act of love, but that doesn't come apart from a life transformed by God is softened by relationships with others. They shared life and they shared burdens because they shared an experience. Not as we tend to call them today a particular worship experience. Not because God did a miracle and they saw tongues of fire and spoke in other languages. The experience that they shared is way more radical than any of that. The experience that they shared is that they acknowledged Christ as the one and only true Son of God. And that in believing in Him, a process started in them where their hearts are being made new. And then along with that, they received the gift that the Bible says comes at the same time that we confess Christ as Lord. And that is the movement of the Holy Spirit into their lives. The experience that they had was not something physical, but it was transformational because of the supernatural nature of it. Paul writes in another place that this experience is like taking off your old clothes and putting on new ones. I remember when I used to work for the lawn service and my mom would yell at me if I got too far past the front door and still had those clothes on. The expectation was that when you come into this house with those nasty clothes, you are going to put them in the laundry room and you're going to shower and get cleaned up and you're going to put on something new. And praise God, what the Bible says is that when you and I confess Christ as Lord, he takes all that old garbage off of us. It's not that we do it. He takes it off of us. And then he gives us something new to wear. It's a new identity. It's a new standing in him. It's a new position in this world. It's a new hope for eternity. But it's all of those things bringing change within our hearts. You see, on some level, you and I have to come to grips with that if we have said a prayer or walked an aisle, but we're not changing, maybe we didn't really meet Christ. It's not that he's not sufficient. It's not that he failed. It's that something within us kept us from having that real saving faith. But today can be that day. Just as it was for them. What began the change in their hearts, whether you talk about the original ones who followed Jesus and were called from boats and tax collecting and all of those things to follow them. Or you talk about the other nearly 3,000 who stood in the city that day and heard what Peter said. And the Bible says that they were cut to their hearts and they turned to the apostles and said, what should we do? Whether it was one or the other, the experience was the same. That in that moment that Christ moved within their hearts and they responded to that. And the result of that, the Bible says, was that every need in their, in their community, when I say community in this context, I mean their, their church, their group of 3,000. They think of that for a moment. Every need was met. Because everyone was committed to taking care of all the rest. You see, we've gotten that yet another thing upside down in our modern church culture because we think that the church is supposed to take care of us. We think that when, when we come here and we join a church, it's almost like uh, membership in a club. And now I should get some perks and I should be taken care of and everything should be worked out. If I need some money, the church should handle that. If, if, if I need some counseling, the church should take care of that. If my kids are out of line, Kyle should take care of that. And the church should just come and should meet all of my needs. But that's not the idea. The idea is much more that as I become a part of the body of Christ, that I meet everybody else's needs. Remember, Jesus said, die to self. Oh, yeah. Every need in that community was met. And they worshiped genuinely. I mentioned this earlier, but it was Jesus who introduced that concept of love God and then love others. Love him first. Don't get me wrong. We don't get these inverted. He comes first. We follow him. We obey him. We serve him. He is God and God alone. 
Yet Jesus said the other command is like it. We love God. We love others. When you go to Hebrews 10, 25, and it talks about not forsaking gathering together in worship, it says in that same context that we are to come together and encourage one another and spur one another on. And this, I think, is appropriate for the day that we live in because he says then so much more as you see the day approaching. As you th see things get worse in your lives. As you look and you see things that the Bible predicted being fulfilled all around you. As it progressively is moving in that direction. That much more we need to cling to God and cling to each other. As we do, we can worship Him more deeply. The things that I learn about God from you guys and the things that you learn about God from me should help us to worship Him that much more. Because when I have a widow that looks me in the eye and says, I know what it is to have God supply all my needs, it brings scripture to life. When a single parent who otherwise would seem to be in chaos says to me, I know what it is to have peace and to trust God for tomorrow, even though I don't know what tomorrow will bring. When I see amazing saints that suffer physically with pain every day say, His grace is sufficient. Those interactions, those relationships, the faithfulness that I see in you helps me to understand God to a greater extent and therefore to be able to worship him to a greater extent. And then it takes me another step because as I draw closer to him, and he teaches me what it means to love you more. And then they have favor with their community. Luke begins to wrap things up in verse 47, as he says, that they praise God and they enjoy favor with all the people. That word favor is translated in other places, grace. It's this idea of love that we don't deserve, this love that we don't earn. It's unique used in this context. Usually it's used in the context of God loving us, and we understand that. Like, God loves me in spite of me. There's nothing I can do to earn it. There's no, uh, there's, there's no way that I can make him love me more. There's no way that I can make him love me less. But then that same word is used to say that they had the grace, the favor, the unmerited love of their community. In other words, the people on the outside saw what was going on in the church, and they realized that there was something special going on there. The last couple of years, I've been driving by this ballpark out here, and I've been praying over a way that we could get in and begin to build some relationships there. And this year, we have some people from our church that were on the board, and John was able through that to have a conversation with the president, and we got invited out yesterday. And so there was a bounce house that was out there to represent our church. Four or five of our people were out there talking to people, passing out flyers, and I was asked to give the opening prayer. Just a few seconds after I prayed and they sang the national anthem, as I walked around the corner, I ran into uh, this young woman, and she said, Are you the same pastor that was out there? And I'd like information about your church, and we began to talk. And I'm trying my hardest to describe to her where our church is. Here's what I want you to think about for a minute. In a town this size, I should be able to say First Baptist Highland City, and people know who we are. And understand that I say this with love, and that I am indicting myself just like I am indicting you, but if they don't know who we are or where we are, that's on us and not on them. She had no idea what I was talking about as I described the corner on which we sit. sit. It took me three or four times. And so at this point, I'm thinking, well, she obviously must be new to the area. I said, are you new to the area? No, I'm not. I've been here for a long time. I'm just new to faith. I'm new to being a Christian. And you can say, well, of course, then, if she's not a Christian, there are only so many churches here. And there are thousands of cars that go down this road. We are not hidden by any means. The structure is not. So the question I've got to ask is, are we as believers hiding? What are we not doing that these first Christians were able to do? 
in the time that they spent with each other, in the relationships they invested in with each other. And you've got to understand, too, that we're called to not only invest relationships within this church, but we're called to invest in relationships with other believers that are not a part of this church. But we're also called to invest in relationships with people who don't even know Christ yet because the hope is that one day we get to be witnesses to them. And my friends, if people that live right here, two blocks, if she could be two blocks from this building and have no idea who we are or where we are, Missing something. It goes back to us just simply doing the things that Christ called us to do and being what he called us to be. Because when they did it, what they also saw was that there was growth. There's a lot more going on in this passage than we've been able to talk about. We really didn't talk about the way they worshipped or their dedication to God's word. But if you've been around for more than about a year, you've heard me preach this passage. You may not have recognized it immediately when we got to it. But I preached this the first time within a month of being here. And I've preached it at least once every year since. If you don't remember, I've got to work hard. <laughs> but the point being this. <clears throat> we can't be the church if we're not willing to spend time together. And to build relationships with each other. We were at Disney last night. Priscilla and I snuck away for our, our very, very late Valentine's Day dinner. And we were escaping just as the fireworks and electric show and all that was going on. And the way they're doing it now is there's excerpts from a lot of movies that they play. Just little bits and pieces of them. And we were fighting our way through this crowd, this huge crowd. Um, and suddenly, out of nowhere, um, um, above the noise of the crowd, and for the momentary pause within the fireworks, Olaf's voice came out. And he just simply said, some people are worth melting for. That's the way we should feel about each other. But it doesn't happen from just coming in this room and spending an hour a week and then going away and not thinking about it anymore. It, it comes as we build deep and meaningful relationships with each other. And from that, grow in love. So real quick, these are the things that I'm asking you to do in response today. The first is to be present, and that's two-sided. Part of it is, obviously, I want you to show up here more often. If you're like a two or three time a month person, uh, I mean, they're just asking you to step that up a little bit. Can you be here one more time every month? Could you make it most weeks? Could you make it three out of four instead of two? Could you make it four out of four? Could you change some things in your life that you're not missing multiple weeks at a time? So you can be here and fellowship with others and worship together. But I'm also asking you not just to be present within the walls of this church, but to be present in the lives of the people that you walk with on a daily basis. Can we put our phones away a little bit more often? Can we shut off the TV? Can we have coffee during the week? Can we go out to lunch instead of rushing away immediately after the service? Can we, like they did, share meals together in our homes so that we get to know each other? Be present and then be involved. I'm not going to give up on this. So you either get to hear it from me a lot or you can respond and I'll stop talking about it. Find a ministry to be involved in. Find a way to serve through this church. It could be greeting, it could be being an usher, it could be in the music, audiovisual, it could be working with kids. We, we have huge needs in our kids and nursery ministries right now. Could you give a Sunday a month to be involved? Because I promise you that what will happen is you will build relationships, whether it be with two-year-olds or adults like you. You will build relationships with people and you will get to know them and their families and it will make this more meaningful. But I'm asking you also to get involved in each other's lives. I may get myself fired by the time I'm done today, Kyle. So you know, just be ready to preach next week just in case. Um, a trend that I have noticed most recently is that when we announce some needs, we're going to be at the ballpark. Who can help? Extravaganza is coming up. Who can help? 
We're going to do some painting. Some things need to be cleaned. We're going to do some ministry. Oftentimes, it's our newest folks who show up for the next. And not some of our long-time folks. Be involved. Care enough about each other and our God in this community to do something, one thing, but then also to be involved in each other's lives. When you know that someone has suffered a loss, be a part of their life. Something we've seen a lot in this church over the last couple of years, we've lost some very dear friends, some very dear saints. And, and sometimes we act like the grief from that loss is only going to affect that family for, for a short amount of time. I just sat through some training on grief counseling, and one of the things I learned in there that I didn't realize is that that grieving process can last five to eight years. How quickly do the rest of us go back to our lives while people are still experiencing those waves like ocean waves as they come in? In the church, the body of Christ is not there riding that storm out with it. And so, yeah, be involved here, but just be involved in each other's lives. In a way to make all of that happen, in a way to simplify all of that, is that if you're not already, join a small group of some sort. Less than half of our church population is involved in any kind of small group at all. And the thing that you miss by not doing that is those relationships. Is that time of sharing. This is what's going on. If your small groups run well, it's not just a lecture from a teacher. It is sharing. It's them posing questions and people sharing responses and working through things and helping each other to learn God's word. Helping each other to live out God's word and then standing together in those times of needs. And we're working very hard on giving you options other than just during Sunday school because Sunday school is difficult for some people. So Wednesday night is really a small group now. For those that come to that Bible study, that's the way to do that Bible study now. There's a small group that meets on Friday nights for prayers. And we can launch some others if there's another time that works more conveniently for you. But you've got to let me know that you're willing and able maybe to host or maybe to teach or, or maybe just to be a part of one when we get started. But I promise you, your life and your worship and your experience as a believer will be enriched if you will share it with others. However you choose to. And so I'm going to ask you to do some things as we close out this morning. One is that, as usual, I, I encourage you to find a way to respond, whether it's filling out a card and handing it to me. That uh, number where you can text me your response is still in the bulletin. That's going to stay there anytime you want to use it for a prayer request or a response to a sermon. I want you to still go back there and pray over the request on the prayer wall. But I really want you to spend some time, even if it means not singing this morning, to think about how intently you either are or are not investing in the lives of other people. And I just want you to find one way that you can commit. Just one thing that you can do. I will join a small group. I will join a ministry. I will be that nursery teacher that's needed on Sunday school. I don't I will start intentionally inviting someone to have lunch with me, whatever it may be. I'll, I'll start at Tuesday afternoon coffee hour, and every Tuesday I'm going to invite someone different to join me on that. And I'm going to get to know people on an individual basis and be a blessing to them as best I can. Those are just all different examples. Just, just find one thing. And if you would honor me with this, I would love to hear what that one thing is from you so I can pray for you. My commitment that I have made is that I'm working harder this year than I ever have before to spend individual time with people. Nearly every week now I'm meeting with a leader or I'm meeting with someone in need or I'm just meeting with someone just to get to know you on a personal level. I'm giving you that as accountability. That is what I'm trying to do on a weekly basis, meet with at least one person individually to build a relationship with them. That's my one. What's yours? That you dealt with us as individuals. God, thank you that you sent Christ to die for us as though it was just us. And I pray, Father, that you would help us to value that sacrifice. 
And then not out of obligation or guilt, but out of extreme love and gratitude for what you've done in us, that we would want to turn that love and shine that on someone else. And so help us to make some practical commitments for how we're going to do that. I pray that you would be honored and glorified in this time as we surrender our hearts to God. I know that there are things way outside of the limits of what we've talked about this morning that you're doing in people's hearts right now and burdens that you're working to lift in sin and guilt that you're working to shake loose from our hearts. And we just pray, Father, that for all of those things that go unseen that you do during these moments, uh, that you would give us courage to respond. And we pray for each one of us that we would just take a step closer to you this morning in honoring you.